So again, with the introduction, my name is Zogot Sisani. I was born in Sweden, Port Elizabeth. Do we have any closers in the house? Nazog, yeah. That's cool. So I'm from PE. Um, I lived there seven years of my life. My grandmother raised me because I was a varsity baby uh, for the first seven years. Then I moved to Joburg when I was seven, and then I stayed with my parents, and I grew up there. I uh, went to a school called Crawford. I uh, went to a university called UCT. Uh, I graduated uh, in industrial psychology uh, after my fourth year in a three-year degree. I graduated with a GPA of 53%, so I wasn't very smart. Uh, but I had a hustle mode about me, right? So uh, I went to one conference because uh, I was the president of the Entrepreneur Society at, at UCT. And I was invited over to this conference at Accenture in Johannesburg, and I went down there and I saw one of my uh, Kairos Feathers. His name is Ludwig Marischeiner. So I'm not sure if anybody has heard about Ludwig, a product called Dry Bath, so a, a nice solution where you have to, you can wash yourself with that water. So he was a keynote speaker at the time, and uh, you know what, he was doing a fantastic job. At the end of the conference, I walked up to the managing director, his name was Lee Knight, and I said to him, listen man, I'm the president of UCT Entrepreneur Society, and I've got the best innovation for you in South Africa. Um, I believe the innovation I have for you will get you guys back into the VC space. It aligns correctly with your mandates, and you'll be so impressed in terms of what I have for you in Cape Town. Um, and sure enough, he called me a month later, and he's like, I'm in Cape Town, show me what you've got. And I brought forward a guy, his name was Emil McLennan. He was running a company called eShip. Uh, he won five million rand on Dragon's Den. I brought another guy called Matthew McElbert. Uh, he was running a company called Zest, and so on and so forth. The point of the matter was, Lee was impressed about how disruptive shit was in Cape Town. And he was like, dude, you have got it on lock. You know exactly. Uh, how to align technology and uh, a business case. And I want you to come intern at Accenture. So I went, I interned at Accenture, and um, yeah, then the stories get a lot more dramatic from there. And, uh, but at the end of the day, I run a company called Legacy Technologies. Uh, my company is focused on giving a global footprint to South African startup entrepreneurs. Um, we've taken, within the past 12 months, uh, 50 entrepreneurs fully sponsored uh, to three different conferences this year. Uh, one in Lisbon called Web Summit, uh, happens every November. One in Barcelona called Mobile Web Congress, happens uh, in March. And then another one called uh, Viva Technology that happened in Paris. Uh, Viva Technology is one of my favorite conferences. We were there two months ago. Uh, we made a partnership with the uh, DTI, that's the Department of Trade and Industry. So we had Minister Rob Davies come with us and uh, some of our friends of Legacy, as we call them, so the likes of your Andile Kumalos, Lebo Gongolusas, Puti uh all people that advocate for the growth and the global footprints of South African entrepreneurship and innovation attended with us, as well as 30 entrepreneurs. This is the first time in an audience of 80,000 people, 80,000 people come from 142 different countries to this conference. First time ever they've had um, more than 30 South Africans, or Africans, so to speak. So my company is really focused on taking away this dark continent element that the world speaks about with Africa. Um, there's a lot of strong innovation that I've seen within Africa, and you guys will be very surprised that everybody, or well, the innovation we have in South Africa is really much on point with the kid in China, the kid in the US, in LA, or there may be. Um, the ecosystem in South Africa, unfortunately, is broken. Uh, this comes down to the support mechanisms from funding, um, from exposure, from access, ma market access, etc. This is where South Africa, we are disadvantaged, but in terms of the brilliance of ideas and the minds that we have within South Africa, we're really on par with what's going on globally, and I've seen that for myself for the past two years. And, uh, and I'm really just bringing light to that. I'm really just trying to tell the African innovation story. And um, yeah, so we did that. We had a whole South African pavilion gazebo, and we're going to do it again um, in Dubai in October, and, and so on and so forth. But I don't want to deviate too far from the interview. So cool. Um, yeah. Well, you know, giving hearing about that, and why why do you do what you do? Because so there's a bit of a like social. This is social entrepreneurship. So I mean, like a lot of people are like, oh man, I was a born entrepreneur. I've known this like my whole life. I wanted to be an entrepreneur. 
Me, on the other hand, like it was just one big mistake and another big mistake and another big mistake. But at the end of the day, it's just all those big mistakes were big strides of courage and big strides of choosing purpose over comfort, and which kind of landed me in here because, I mean, I was happy to get a job. I mean, if you're getting 53% GPA in of taking four years to do it in a humanities degree, you're happy you got a job. Like, let's just start out there. Like, you were lucky to even get employed. So I wasn't even keen on the whole entrepreneurship idea. It, it was just one coincidence after another. Um, and I'm sure I'll get into the story later in terms of like the, the intricacies of how I ended up running the company. Um, but I saw the gap. I saw that South Africa really has like a lot of potential. And I saw the international ecosystem that was so committed to entrepreneurship. I mean, when I went to Los Angeles in 2015, um, the mayor of Los Angeles had put in electro, what's this, uh, electronic car charges in every single lamppost. Do you know how big LA is? LA is bigger, or California. California is bigger than the whole of Europe. In every single lamppost, there's a charger for your electronic car in the year of 2015. Do you understand how committed you must be to the future? To say that we must prepare that every car is going to be electronic, prepare that our citizens can be able to charge their cars at any point in time whilst they're driving on the road. This commitment from government was a huge, like, I don't know, a mind-blowing experience to me to say that, are you so, so committed to Industry 4.0? Are you so sure it's coming? Because where I'm from in South Africa, like if you start talking tech, yeah, dude, now, now you, you're talking sideways. Why aren't you talking uh, agriculture? Why aren't you talking mining? That's the real entrepreneurship. So where I'm from here, you know, in South Africa, we hadn't even gone into this point where we had started adopting or started being forward thinking enough to say, this is where we're going. And there was countries and spaces, as I'm telling you now, where that made the commitment long before. This is why now you have companies going public like Facebook worth millions of dollars and having Mark Zuckerberg being the third richest person and having Jeff Bezos being the richest person on the planet through e-commerce. Do you understand what that means? Whilst in South Africa, our rich tycoons are all involved in mining, property, the typical entrepreneurship, traditional stuff, right? But we're going in a certain direction and I don't think we've opened up our eyes to it. So for the fact that I could have been a pioneer in something really was more important to me. That's why I became this entrepreneur. I mean, like, sure, money, wealth, that stuff really matters to me, but for me, influence means so much. If I was in a position to say that from South Africa, from the continent of Africa, I am able to bring light to or, or create the connection or create the global footprint for Africa and South Africa on a global level, that was not being done you know, two years ago. And I started that movement. I, I don't want to TM that. I don't know if this is official or not. But you know, to have begun something that's that deep, for me, it made more sense to me and was more impactful for me. And because that impact was so much deeper, that's how you know, I can wake up every day and say, you know, what I'm doing right now is, is something that's going to outlast me. It's something that's going to really put South Africa on a, on a global scale, on a map that I couldn't have done um, by myself. But at the same time, I could have visioned it. And because of my vision and because of what I've, I've done in the past two years, what we have done has started to grow and expand. And, you know, we've got more support now from government, from private entity, etc. cetera. Uh, but yeah, the point of the matter is that we, we, we've grown this thing from nothing. And and uh, we've put South Africa on a global scale. Splendid. And you spoke about mistake after mistake after mistake. Yeah. Would you mind sharing, say, I don't know, one of the <laughs> biggest blunders and how you got through it? Cool, guys. So I was hired at Accenture as a management consultant. Again, I didn't feel like I deserve to be there. Like, guys, I'm, I'm a really good, I'm, I'm one of the top salespeople I know. Like, for me, I was like, yo, dude, you know how to sell anything I could sell anything I think I don't know the point of the matter is so I'm in this I'm in this uh, graduate program of Accenture they hired 20 people throughout the country everybody around me in this room has got like a master's in engineering has like come louder um, is Dean's list and really are prepared for this this world of work right and here I am uh, graduate industrial psychology um, you know, took too long to graduate, graduated with not that 
got of a grade. I mean, if I had applied the normal way, uh, my application would have been like, you know, would have gone to HR and the software would have turned me down before anyone even got to read it because they would have been like, you're wasting our time, dude. You don't, <laughs> you don't have the right qualifications for it. So thank God, you know, through the, the, the managing director, I got in. But the point of the matter is, I get into the space and um, yeah, man, because of who I am, I was able to get onto really co cool projects. So uh, my first project, Accenture, was working for McDonald's. And uh, because I got a really good understanding of technology, they wanted to see how can we really create a frictionless purchase for our customers and really up our sales. And um, you know, I thought of something very simple. It's called geofencing, right? So if you walk within this environment, I'm here at Mazars, whatever it may be, and let's say there was a McDonald's in the building. So David walks into this building now and there's a McDonald's on the third floor. It's gonna send him a push notification on his cell phone saying, David, would you like your, your usual six nuggets with jalapeno sauce and a Diet Coke? You know, that was something that breaks down the friction to say, should I have McDonald's today? Should I not have McDonald's today? You know? So having McDonald's proactively communicate with you and actually engage with you is something that, you know, I, I, I read about and I understood the technology and I was able to say, you know what, we're moving towards a, a consumer-centric uh, way of work within digital and, and that's how I was able to uh, get on some really cool projects. But I was on really cool projects and I was on a project that actually only came into realization now. I was on a project where Barclays was leaving APSA. So I was a project manager of Barclays leaving Absa before they came up with this really cheesy uh, logo that they have now. I was working on that and um, what had happened was, uh, so I'm, I'm on this project and we're working on it and now I'm, I'm doing the, uh, I'm a scrum master, I'm not sure if you, people know about Agile, it's this project management, boring, boring stuff. Um, anyway, so I'm on this project and on the weekend I go to one of my friend's birthday parties. So he's having this cool birthday party or whatever, and I go there and I see this girl in the corner of the room. She's very attractive, let me just say that for, for the, this uh, uh, dramatic effect. She's got an antsy beat, I'm like, woo, got my blood boiling. <laughs> So I walk up to her and I start speaking to her and I tell her like, listen, I was invited to this conference in Hong Kong, but I can't afford to go. I can't afford my own way there. Uh, it's unfortunate, but you know what? How are you doing? Whatever it may be. We start talking random. She's like, oh, you know, you know who I am. I said, I don't know who you are. Who are you? So she tells me, no, my mother's the ambassador of South Africa and, and Hong Kong or whatever. You know that, right? I'm like, no, I didn't. So I was like, this is crazy. I was like, I really wanted to go to Hong Kong to this conference, but I can't afford my way. She's like, oh, she'll check with her mom if, we can, if I can go. Uh, if I can stay at her home. So, yeah, dude, no shit. Monday comes, 11 a.m., I get a call from the ambassador from Hong Kong. She's like, you know how black people, we all related to someone. She's like, ah, Suko, I know your uncle from what, 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 we family. Come stay at my place. So this is 11 a.m. on the Monday. And um, at Accenture, I was earning 19,000 rand a month. So that's how much you get paid in a graduate program. If there's any students here, that's, that's it. Um, the point of the matter is that I used half my salary to buy myself for a return ticket to Hong Kong. This is 11,000 rand cost me out of my 19,000 rand budget. And um, at, my flight was at 3 p.m. So I'd spent 11,000 rand at 11 a.m. I got to the airport at 12 and I was on a flight to Hong Kong within the next three hours after that. Send my manager a message. I'm saying, listen, I'll be back next Thursday. I need to go to Hong Kong quickly. And um, he, was, uh, he was an Indian fellow. I can't, I can't do the accent. He's like, so what are you doing? What are you doing? <laughs> like, what are you doing? And I'm like, dude, this is really important. Like, I, there's something I need to see. There's something, there's something I'm, that's really drawing me to this thing. And uh, if, if I'm going to do my talk later, it's going to come up. Uh, but basically, you know, it was a choice between purpose and comfort, and I chosen purpose in that moment. Um, and I went over to Hong Kong. Uh, and sure enough, by the time I'd landed, I received the first message I got was my termination. So now I'm like, I'm young, I'm broke, and I'm unemployed as well. I'm like, fuck. <laughs> so anyway, I get to this conference, I walk in, and I start, guys, I really want to attend this conference. I'm from South Africa, and they're like to me, oh, do you have a ticket? I'm like, no. Then I'm like, but I literally just got off the flight right now, and I kind of broke down the story, and they're like, all American, they're like, Man, that's exactly what entrepreneurship's all about, man. You are so noble for doing that. Like, that's crazy. And they give me this platinum band. So here I am, this big mistake, you know, absconded from my job, basically. 
I get into this conference, and uh, because of this platinum band, I go backstage. Now I'm hanging out with Jack Dorsey. So Jack Dorsey is the founder of Twitter. I'm hanging out with Travis Kalanick. Travis Kalanick founded Uber. Uh, Michael Dell, Dell Computers, are in Huffington, Huffington Post. And um, yeah, I mean, from that point, you get quite comfortable with these people in the room. You're like, dude, these are my peers. This is my level, you know what I mean? <laughs> So, I mean, I don't know how much Jack liked me because I've only got like 200 followers and he like, he owns the whole thing. So, uh, <laughs> I don't know, either he's an asshole or I was, I don't know what happened. Um, the point of the story is that was a big mistake, but it led me to the situation where I'm exposed to this huge world of tech and I'm really like taking this all in because we don't see this stuff in South Africa. I mean, our big tech conferences, you have like the guy from MTN or the whatever, like that's what we have. But like down there, you know, you hang out with Mark, you're hanging out with Jack, you're hanging out with Travis. That's that's the level. And the level of thinking, you know, is a global mindset, which is something we don't have on the constant. We have we're very intimate with our innovation. Um, and we're just consumers, we're not actually producers or we do not actually impact uh, the way society works, which is what I'm gonna change. Uh, long story short. The founder of the conference, his name is uh, Paddy Cosgrave. He walks up to me because I'm VIP, so he wants to treat me properly. He says to me, you know what, what brought you here? And uh, I said to him, you know what, I, was just, I just decided, let me pop into Hong Kong. I decided yesterday, <laughs> which is the truth. And he's like, that's great. I was like, you know what, I want to bring this to South Africa. What's it going to take? He says to me, yeah, man, next time you bring me a million dollars, we can make something happen. I was like, okay, cool, we could do that. <laughs> yeah, US, dude. So, yeah, I mean, I could finish the story, I could not, but yeah, we can move on. Cool, um, so you mentioned, you know, that, that as a country, we don't think global. Um, so tell us a bit more about that. Like one of the things I hear a lot of entrepreneurs in Bloemfontein say is, you know, I wanna start something here, but the market here, it's Bloemfontein. It's not gonna work because it's Bloemfontein. You know, that's kind of, just in this city, the issue sure. that we have. So when starting a business, do you start with global in mind first? That's a really good question. I mean, so we take a, a mixed breed or hybrid of entrepreneurs that are, are doing a lot of work that are, that's particular to the South African situation and also entrepreneurs that are able to properly expand and, and franchise globally, right? The reason why is this. We are trying to obviously attract investment into South Africa. Um, and number two, we're also trying to get adoption of uh, international markets into South African products or services um, that is, is easily uh, amicable or you know, um, um, serviced internationally or does not need IP or anything. It just needs, well, it just needs the IP or an API on top of that. But the point of the matter is this. Um, so, a lot of the times, yes, I think it's important to think how does how can how is what I'm building going to expand from level one, ground zero, to my immediate environment, ground one or whatever on a national, and then continental, and then global. If not, am I going to be able to monopolize my markets intimately? Because I mean, if you you either going to get a slice of your markets here within Bloemfontein uh, and uh, then try get a slice of South Africa, then try get a slice of continental, try get a slice of global. Or if you're in a very, you know, niche mass market focused uh, element, I'll give an example. I've got a, one of the guys I've, I've, I took over to Lisbon as well as to Paris with me one month ago. His name is Nzako uh, Mkiba. He runs a company called Jonga. It's a, it's a low cost security solution. So basically uh, it's, it's like a, a sensor in your home, right? And this thing costs like 300 bucks. And basically if someone walks into your home, it sends a push notification or message to your neighbor saying someone's in person A's home, or it sends a message to you first saying someone's in your home, is it friendly, is it not friendly? Then if you say it's not friendly, it's gonna tell your neighbors and alert your neighbors because the challenge is obviously, you can't have ADT everywhere, right? So you cannot have the police in so many spaces. So this thing is really trying to figure out how do we as a community start looking after each other? So that's what the solution's really about. Um, and you can't really think of this thing being applicable in like America or in Paris or whatever it may be. But we're also looking at the situation where we're trying to say, how are we able to attract 
um, this solution where a person can say, he can see the vision of this saying, you know, I can see this work in Brazil, I can see this happening in Angola, as well as South Africa. This is a mass market solution and it's something that can really monopolize that space because there's not a, a lot of solutions in the security space within the low cost uh, segments. Um, so I do bring over solutions where it's, it, there is no applic uh, applicability to uh, a first world country, uh, but it does necessarily attract an, a first world investor to say that this could be our numbers because Mtsako's, you know, market is, is, is unfortunately 80% of our country. Um, and, and that's what it is, yeah. Okay, um, I'm, I'm Heinrich. I yeah, Heinrich. just want to know, where were you at the Web Summit last year? Because I didn't see you. Didn't you see us? <laughs> so we brought over 20 entrepreneurs. We're sponsored by Standard Bank. Uh, did you see any other South Africans? Yes. Who did two. you see? Anton, um, Carl, I can name them all. I saw Coach Mentor or something like Mentor no. Jam or something like that. Uh -uh, it um, wasn't and there was like one or two others which I can't remember. But I didn't see If anything. you remember them, they most likely came with me. So that was the first time we actually had, um, uh, we brought the largest South African um, delegation to Web Summit. So what, what space are you in? Um, we were, I was in um, HR Tech at, at that stage. HR Tech. Uh, I can't think of any HR tech. Do you know Hispani? No. Okay. <laughs> anyway, okay, but that's um, yeah. just out of curiosity. Um, I don't know if you're going to get into this, but how do we get into um, going to one of these summits sure. next time? So yeah, there's two ways that I, I take over entrepreneurs. The one way is that we have a partnership with the DTI. That's the Department of Trade and Industry. So they basically vet your company to say, is it, is it under 25 million that you're making revenue? We wanted to bring over Yoko to Paris with us because we want to take over the stronger companies. Unfortunately, they were making more revenue than the DTI allowed. There's, there's a certain, you know, T's and C's around how you can get over in terms of that sponsorship from the DTI, which I can avail to you and we can all go. Um, and then there's also private sponsorship. So whether it's Standard Bank, like they did last year, they, they sponsored us 20 entrepreneurs, uh, cost them a million rand. Or, yeah, so it's either private enterprise. So next year we're going to be working with Dimension Data, um, Standard Bank, and a couple of other things that are in the final stages but not complete yet, so I can't speak about. But they, they, there's private sponsorship where we look at the talents, you know, to say that we want this to represent South Africa. So then you, you, you measure it on a, what's the word, meritocracy? Oh, my God. Help me there. Metocracy. Metocracy? Metocracy. Merit, merit, merit based. Oh, no, no oh, but there's. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> On a merit based level, right? To say that you are, you are top talent within South Africa and you, we want you to represent South Africa on the space. Then there's obviously DTI looking at to say that, listen, we would like you know, our SME, MMEs to be represented um, that do need the opportunity to grow, that do not have the funds and whatever it may be. So there are those two spectrums. So it's either you fall in the top spectrum where you are top talents, we are able to find you tal um, sponsorship to go over, uh, or you fall into the, the, the DTI, the, the government sponsorship. So next year we are taking over 100 and we hope to, to try have an even split for um, Viva Technology. This year at Web Summits, we're not doing a too big, we're going with about 30 entrepreneurs. Um, and yeah, I'll, there's documentation for both of it, but if you just email us, we'll just send you out the documents and you'll fill, fill them in. We'll send your application in. If your application gets cleared by that, you get in. Or if you want to get sponsored by um, a private enterprise, we have to obviously put you forward and present you to say, this could be a potential supplier to you. You know, if you are able to service within, obviously, telecoms, you know, to speak to Dimension Data or BCX, you know, you're able to say that I, I've i got, um, you know, startup B here that would like to get sponsorship from you, therefore sponsor them. And they'll obviously look at you to say, this is, there's a potential relationship here and a future and longevity in this relationship. And that's how I also am able to get you sponsorship to go over. So, yeah. Cool. Good evening, everyone. My name is Ali. I wanted to find out, do you have mentorship programs that will help individual companies to accelerate their growth, company growth? Yeah. Uh, so the answer to that is no, unfortunately. Um, so what I, I really wanted to do, you know, during this time, um, this is our downtime. So we have, we have six conferences a year. 
Um, one in January at CES in Las Vegas. We have another one, Mobile Web Congress in Barcelona. We have Viva Technology in, in Paris. Then we have Jitex in, in Dubai. Then we have Web Summit in um, uh, Lisbon. And then we have well, women in technology or women in power, whatever, in London. We only attend two of them or, or three of them, depending on how big the group is. So this is our downtime. I'm not doing a lot in terms of the preparations for the next thing, which is Jitex in, at the end of October. So I like to think about you know, me spending time in these spaces as my form of mentorship. I, I don't personally, in a lot of the times, have capacity to, to mentor. What I do advise sometimes is that if a person feels that you know, what they're doing is related in my space in terms of promoting South African entrepreneurs or growing an ecosystem or really finds a fit in terms of what I can do, uh, we do do internships. Um, in fact, we're hiring in January um, and we'll, we'll give you more information around that later. But I, I, there's, there's no particular time I dedicate to look after someone else's life. I think that would be more irresponsible of me than anything else, yeah. Okay, how's it guys? I'm Costa. Um, I'm in the fast moving goods industry. Uh, you mentioned as a salesperson you, you can sell pretty much anything. Yeah. Um, although I'm very far away from the tech space, I want to know as a salesperson, what do you think drives sales? Because I, I, th I feel I'm, I'm quite a salesman as well. but. Um, do you think it's the same in the tech as it is in every other industry? And, and what is it that really drives sales, in your opinion, to people? Cool. So what I think really drives sales, in my opinion, uh, are three things, really. So, you know, as being, being young, black, pretty much poor education, it's very hard to get a sale through in terms of big corporates. What I what really got really good at was, one, you know, assimilating their values, right? A lot of the times people come to me and don't exchange that value. So for example, the whole mentorship thing, you know, it's, it's very selfish to say, but it's, what do I gain, you know? But if someone has said to me, you know, I'd like to intern for you, I'd like to come on board or whatever, I'm thinking, you know, someone's here to help drive sales or whatever it may be. So whenever I go to a particular client, I've got over 106 versions of the same deck but for different clients, why? Because I try to think about, assimilate what they value. So whenever I go into a situation where I'm trying to make a sale, I try to make it seem that they're getting more out of it than I'm actually taking, you know what I mean? So assimilating their values in terms of saying, you guys value, I don't know, so you're saying in the fast? Fast food. Cleaning. Okay, I thought you were going to talk about like um, food products necessarily. No. So I mean, yeah, so so trying to simulate is basically say, okay, cool. Who's currently servicing the client that I'd like to have? Who are they giving money to? Who have they turned down? Why do they give money to that person in particular? Try to simulate those values. Two, I really think ab about you know the mimicking really. So I mean, like I really like to mimic the way people speak in terms of key words. So a very fantastic example I have is one of my former uh, bosses. He loved saying the word value. Like value literally like was every second word. You should really, I think we value this, we value that, whatever it may be. But if you're able to speak the way they speak, use the same kind of body language, speak to their values, speak to a way that it's, you're able to, to go into the situation already knowing what the outcome could be, or expecting a positive outcome, because you've done thorough research to say, this is what you give money to and I'm it. So if you're able to create yourself in a certain way and mold yourself, so some people, you may call it lying, you may call it not, but I listen to what the customer really spends money on and I'm already that, I, I, I become that. That's what my company does. What, what, you, what you spend money on is what I am. And that's what you should start altering your sales proposal to because when you start saying, I'm better than these other guys, we niche in our markets, blah, 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 bullshit. Like, you're not going to be the first person to come there. But once you start speaking to what they already give money to, you've opened yourself, or you put yourself in the door, you know, to say, we already give money to, you know, situation or value proposition X. This is guys offering the same thing. Then you walk in there and you're able to almost be relatable in a certain way. That's, that's point number B. How are you able to be relatable in terms of saying, you know, we actually 
hang out with this guy. I mean, if I tell you the um, the guys that I, I hang out and I drink with, you know, you would be surprised. But I mean, we get to a point where you're able to be relatable because you have now every customer you go to, you are what they buy. I think a lot of times people are so funding centric, like they always think about how am I going to get money, but people are not customer centric. You're not thinking about what does my customer value? Because if you were customer centric, you would go in there, you would know what they want, you'd be able to respect that, you'd be able to speak the same values in that language and that's how you get the business, I think. Um, actually, just that last part of um, your um, uh, you know, answer, just answers to what I wanted to ask. So um, I just recently heard, you know, uh, in the tech space where um, Lynette and Tuli was basically saying, it's not the app that sells, it's the solution. So I'm thinking um, tech is the buzz right now in Africa and, you know, I'm, I'm rooting off for that. So what I just wanted to know is that, so um, let's say you're coming up with the idea, the digital idea. So how do you go about into quantifying, you know, the, the business value of what's going to come out of your app because you know every other day there's an app coming out and yes it does solve something but um when you're now going into tech how do you put value to this app that you're coming about uh, coming yeah. with, up with and then just another second question would be um what's the criteria that you you know you look at when you you know you take on companies that are looking for investors okay so the first part of the question was about how do you expand um an app and to to the market and um my values around apps and technology and getting it to be sold <coughs> It's very skewed to how the South African mindset is. The South African mindset, as I was speaking about, I think I mentioned a bit earlier, briefly in the previous answer of the question, when I said people are so investor-centric, everybody would rather knock on doors of investors than knock on doors of customers. So if you're able to build an MVP and start selling that, right, the way that you're going to get funding or whatever your heart desires is once you be, you're able to demonstrate traction, reputation, and you're able to demonstrate a client base. <laughs> so a lot of people come up to me and say, look, Zugo, I've got this great idea, or whatever it may be, I need two million rands, like, help me do it. Um, those messages and emails all get blue ticks and I'm just, just letting you guys know now, if you're gonna send me a mail asking me for money, I'm probably going to say no, not reply. But if you're able to come to me and say, look, Zugo, we've built this, we've got X um, amounts of customers, we're going in this direction, how can you get us investment? So you spoke about investment, and we're currently venture partners of the IDF, and this year alone we've actually funded um, over 15 million rands to, to five companies. And um, how it works normally is that the, the vetting process and the due diligence is, is done quite uh, intrinsically. So they look again, do we have a business yet? The only way we can prove if we have a business is if there's sales, is there something that's moving through. I'm not asking you for a great, you know, gross profit. I'm asking you to demonstrate, does your idea make sense? Is it expandable? Is it, is it you know, linear in terms of the growth? Is it exponential? How are we moving with this thing? But is there a business? So once someone comes to me and says, I have a business, we are able to get in a conversation to say, you know, I can say I can connect you with a, uh, a high net worth individual, or I can try find these programs for you that currently do the funding that they come to me to ask for entrepreneurs. And if I, I'll put my name behind you and say, you know what, here's person B, I think should invest in them because one, they have a business. They've now created this MVP. The app is not the greatest, it's got all these bugs, but they have a thousand customers within Bloom. They're looking for a way to expand it in Johannesburg. They can see the gap in this way because they understand that LSM within the sector works like this and they understand the spending behavior works like that. If you're able to articulate as to how this money moves to grow, that's perfect. If you want me to find your idea, carry on dreaming because I mean, there's just a lot of people that have ideas. I've got an idea now, you know, what's gonna happen? Who's gonna give me money? Like, don't get into that space where you want people to sponsor your dreams. I think that's where entrepreneurship just goes all wrong. 
Start knocking on the doors of your customers and stop knocking on the doors of investors. And that's my advice, yeah.